All right, welcome to IS50A. It's not week one. I normally give this talk on week one, but we, we just went hard into Unreal Engine immediately. So uh, it's week five now, and we're finally uh, going to talk about game design principles. So for your assignment, you have to... Um, turn off streamer mode. Turn on streamer mode. Uh, I have 15 hours in Starfield. Uh, a bit more than that now, I think. Uh, let me see how many hours I have. Uh, do, 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 do. Starfield, I have 35 hours in Starfield over the weekend. Yeah, I was playing it a bit. So, uh, for this class, the big things you have to do in this class are you have to create one mod and you have to create one uh, project in Unreal Engine. The thing that we're building up in Unreal Engine day after day after day, that could turn into your final project. So you should probably start thinking about, like, uh, you know, like what sort of theme you want to have, what sort of... Uh, game maybe you want to play so that when you're doing things like make an underwater area like if you're if your theme is like um, i don't know sci-fi you could have like alien artifacts under the water and uh when you're making i don't know materials you can make like sci-fi looking materials and things like that just to save yourself some effort at the end of the semester you don't have to know what you're going to do right now but what i want you to do is start thinking about the uh the design of your game. And that's kind of what this lecture is on here. So uh, basically um, everybody here has played a game. Yes or no? Give me a, give me a show of hands in chat. Is it, is it's kind of common for us to not get um, gamers. Like uh, usually there's like two or three or four or five students in a semester that just don't play games. Um, so it, it's give me on chat, you know, what games you've probably played the most of. And I'll talk a little bit more about the expectations, the expectations for this semester. So there's two main projects that you're gonna have to do. There's a mod and there is your Unreal Engine thing. The mod can be a modification of any game out there. One of the best ways of learning how to do game dev is by looking at how experienced game devs have made decisions in the past and learning from them essentially by going into their project and modifying it. And then you gotta once you're inside of it, you get to look around, be like, oh, so that's how that's how those guys figured that out. And you get to learn from the masters, so to speak. And so the mod is going to be a quarter of your grade, and then your Unreal uh, project is a quarter of your grade. And uh, a lot of Skyrim, Pokemon, Terraria, like 10 minutes ago. Uh, Raymond is going to be modifying uh, Terraria, so if you want to mod Terraria, maybe you can uh, send him a message and see if you guys can work together on it. Uh, trying 100% Starfield right now. Yeah, me too. Uh, it, it's oh, There's a lot of content in that game, though. A lot of content. Um, so I've been playing Halo. Yeah, yeah. So we got first-person shooters. We got RPGs here. Uh, Terraria is like, I don't know what the right genre is for Terraria. Side-scrolling, RPG, base-building, crafting. I don't know. Something like that game, Starfield, uh, you know, first person role playing game, things like that. Okay. So when you're designing your game, you have to think about the principles of game design and the principles of game design are the elements that go into a game that make it fun or not fun, depending on how well you implement them. And so there are things like luck. And so luck is one of those really tricky things to get right. Okay. So uh, have any of you guys played a game called Magic of the Gathering? So you have a deck of 60 cards usually, and you shuffle them, and then you start by drawing seven cards. And then every turn you draw one card, assuming nothing changes that. So Tarkov, Rainbow Six Siege, yeah. And so you think, okay, well, it's just, it's just luck, you know, what cards I get. But the uh, designer of... Uh, Magic the Gathering, um, people got bullied for it, it's funny. Richard Garfield, he allowed you to put multiple copies of the same card into a deck, up to four. And so, and for lands, you can have more than that, but for like the interesting cards, you can have up to four usually in a deck. And so that allows you to adjust the luck on it. If you have four cards, you're gonna get that card on average one every 15 draws. And so with seven draws to begin with, it's like a 50-50 of even starting with it, you know? And so there are ways of manipulating the luck in, in Magic the Gathering. There's 
all sorts of cards that tutor for cards where it allows you to dig through the deck and pull a card out. Um, there's ways of like tossing cards from your deck into your graveyard and then pulling cards out of the graveyard. There's lots of ways of like getting to the, the cards that you need to pull off your combo, whatever it is you're trying to go for. So Richard Garfield gave a great talk on game design principles and he talked about luck. So let me find it. Uh, Richard Garfield game design on luck. Luck versus skill with Richard Garfield. Um, yeah, so uh, this is a great talk. Uh, I'll post this on chat for you guys. And uh, the thing is, a little bit of luck in a game oftentimes makes it interesting. Like I'm not, I I actually don't like games with zero luck in it. Like chess, I re, I used to love chess a lot. I I was actually like ranked, you know, not. <laughs> Which is not to say I had a high rank. <laughs> it's like it's like the advertisement at for Fresno State at the airport. It says we're nationally ranked. It doesn't tell you what the ranking is. It just says we're nationally ranked. Like, like <laughs> where? <laughs> yeah. So I I had I had a, a chess uh, ranking at one point, and then I got tired of it because chess is the same every time. And while some people really like exploring and mastering, like, you know, the, the starting locations of every piece in chess is fixed. You know, it's always the same every time. Uh, Bobby Fischer actually proposed a chess variant where you sort of randomize the pieces. You know, so you sit down to play, you roll some dice, and maybe the queen and the, and, you know, the rook or something switches. You know, so you can't just memorize, you know, openings, which is what... Um, a lot of experience, well, pretty much all experienced chess players do at, at a certain level. They have all these openings memorized, which again turned me off on it because I wanted to be creative and to think about things, and people would just memorize books and books of openings, and that just really didn't appeal to me. And so uh, Bobby Fischer suggested adding a little bit of chaos into it, you know, to make it more interesting. So I, I think a little bit of luck actually makes things feel new, novel, interesting. Um, I get bored with checkers and chess and things like that because it's the same game every time, right? But um, the guy who worked on Splinter Cell Blacklist had a good TED talk. Uh, if you can, uh, if you can pull that up, I'll I'll, I'll put it up on the screen here. But Richard Garfield in this talk, if this is the talk that uh, I was thinking of, um, made a really good point um, that experienced players hate luck, right? Because if uh, if you play a game where like you know you flip a coin to win, there's no difference between an experienced player and a new player. Like a new player can beat an experienced player half the time, and so experienced players hate it because they because when you put time and effort into mastering a game like Smash Brothers, um, you want to be able to crush your, your foes and see them driven before you. You know what I mean? Like you know you you roll in strong and then somebody just picks up an item. And it uh, explodes everybody on the screen and you lose. Experienced players kind of hate luck. They, they, they turn off items in Smash Brothers. Like no randomness, no chance. It's pure skill. And then they crush the new players. On the flip side, new players love random items like that. Why? Because it gives them a chance to win. They're still not going to win very often. But, you know, if, if there is a, you know, a chance, then that makes them more likely to play, more likely to get into it. Uh, more likely to have fun if they're like just in a party situation and everyone's playing Smash and some people are better than others. Having items sort of evens the field a little bit and uh, gives the new players more fun. And so luck is a very tricky thing to get right. Modeling AI perception systems and Splinter Cell. Oh, very cool. There we go. GDC. Yeah, so uh, for those of you that don't know, I used to actually take students to GDC every year. I might do it again this, this uh, spring. Uh, GDC is the Game Developers Conference. It's in San Francisco every year, except during the pandemic. I had I had a field trip all lined up, and I was like, oh, you know, yeah, COVID. Uh, <laughs> it was kind of, it was really interesting because this was like 2020, and everything's like kind of closing down, and like companies are canceling, and and like we're still gonna host it. You know, there's like two companies left. And they're like, okay, we're not gonna host it. Um. But uh, GDC has a huge amount of videos on the trade craft of, of developing video games available online. I 
highly recommend if you guys are serious about this career i highly recommend watching these videos especially you know right now it might be a little bit too advanced for you um it's like if you don't know even like the basic terminology and lingo of the of the field it might not you know mean too much but um uh basically like especially after maybe towards the end of this class when you start kind of understanding how like animations work and ai programming and, and things like that um seeing how the masters have done it is really interesting and i've, I've been to a bunch of the talks in person and uh and it's it's expensive to go there like it's san francisco um so like at a minimum you have to drive out and then they don't have student uh, passes anymore they used to have student uh, badges they got rid of those so it's not cheap to go to gdc but the videos are free so i highly recommend that mario kart item luck yeah exactly and uh in mario kart uh the the items right are not the same if you're in first place can you get a blue shell can you like if you do you guys know mario kart like uh if you're in first place, what are the items you can get in first place versus fifth place versus last place? Do you guys know? It's it's luck. It's random, but it's constrained luck. Like they they uh, put their finger on the scale, so to speak. Do you guys know the difference between uh, the the different luck that you get? Yeah, you don't even get like the triple banana. You get like a single banana, right? Last place, you can get a blue shell. You can also get the communism bullet, right? That like just basically zips you forward. So you're not in last place anymore, usually, unless you're really bad. <laughs> First place, you can't get the blue shell at all. Yeah. First place, you get like a single banana, a coin. Green shell, maybe? Can you get a green shell if you're in first place? I think. Maybe. That's about it. Um,. A music box, maybe? maybe? Maybe the music box is like second place. Um, do you guys know if you can get a music box when you're in first place? That's the thing that like destroys everything around you. Um, I don't remember if you can get that. But yeah, so basically when you're in last place, you get the best stuff. You get like triple shells and, and all the like crazy stuff. When you're like in fifth place, you can get like red shells. Um, very rare for the music box in first. Yeah, I think... I think you can, but I, I don't quote me on it. So, so that's one of the ways that Mario Kart tries to even out last place and first place is last place gets a lot more luck than first place. First place gets really bad items. Like I kept getting single coins over and over again. Just like, oh my gosh. Uh, if you're in second, you can get a blue and then get into first place and then shell yourself. Yeah. <laughs> it's called blue yourself. <laughs> It's like a self goal in uh, soccer, right? When you score a goal on your own team. Okay. So uh, let's talk about what does it mean to be a game? So you guys have all played games here. Um, not all the students are, are here right now. So maybe not everybody in this class has played games, but well, I'll just assume they are based on the responses I've gotten here. So what do you think it means to be a game? Like what's your definition of a game? Like, do you think a slot machine is a game? It's called Indian gaming, right? Like, you go to Chuck Chansey, you put a quarter into the slot machine, you pull the arm, it goes dum, dum, dum. It's like, you lost a quarter. You're like, yay, it's so much fun. It's just as good as Mario Kart. Is it, is, is it a game? What do you guys think? Put on a dollar, play nickel slots for a couple minutes, walk away without a dollar. Is that a game? It's called gaming, right? Gaming commissions. When I, when I was a kid and I found out that there was a gaming commission, I'm like, oh, that is my life dream. I want to be on the gaming commission. Nah. <laughs> nah. Unfortunately, it's, you know, gambling, right? The game is just entertainment. You can interact with yourself and cause things to change and happen. Yeah, so with the, the slot machine, you can't really... You know, you can't, there's, you just hit a button, you know, and, and it's like, oh, you won, or you lost, and that's it. You know, it's not, not especially exciting. What about track and field? What about, like, uh, 
I don't know, 100 meter dash, right? You know, everybody lines up, somebody fires a gun, hopefully without a real bullet in it. People take off, first person, yay, wins. It's competition. It's uh, multiplayer, all right? Multiplayer competition, people are racing. It's exciting, people cheer, yay, fastest. Is that a game? 100 meter dash again. What about shot put? What about uh, archery? Right? There's something about archery that makes it feel more like a game. You know what I mean? Like, are, are you guys, like, do you guys agree with me on this? Like, for me, like, thinking about it, like, there's something about archery that, like, feels like a game, you know? Or, like, shooting, like, decathlon or biathlon, whatever. Yeah, biathlon, right? Skiing and shooting, which is a fun combination. You'd think the Finns would win every year. Um, that feels more like a game than, like, I don't know, weightlifting. You know what I mean? Like, sports or games. Yeah, but is it a, I mean, like, you know what I mean? It's like, like, it, weightlifting, like, you just kind of, like, show up and everybody lifts weights. And then, like, somebody wins. Right? Like, it doesn't feel like a game to me. You know what I mean? Like. It's like you could you could theoretically just have people stay at home and like live stream it, you know, like, oh look, I'm lifting up this much weight. And everyone's like, oh, that's more than me. You win. Like, I don't know. you know, and then you zoom in somebody, you know, is like, oh look, I can lift up this much. And then they win, like, I don't know. Like, it doesn't really feel like a game to me. There are games that aren't sports. Archery is like an FPS game. Yeah, yeah. Right. Like you got a target, and you're like hitting the target. I don't know. It feels it feels more like a game to me than like weightlifting. Yeah. You know? uh, have you guys seen reflex test testing machines? Like there's a weight that drops and you grab it. And so basically you have to sit there and wait. You know, you're like, come on, come on, come on. And then it drops, you have to catch it as fast as you can. Is that a game? What do you guys think? And you guys are free to disagree with me too. Like if you if you think weightlifting is a game. Like, it's a sport, but is it a game? I don't know. Not very fun. Or maybe it is. Maybe for some people it's fun. But, like, I don't know. Hand-eye coordination game. Yeah. There's a lot of games like that, right? Like, they just are, like, Twitch games where, you know, you just whoever has the best reflexes wins. That kind of thing. Um, there's an old track and field video game for the fourth bullet point there. Uh, for the NES, the Nintendo Entertainment System. It was literally called track and field. And uh, basically, you would sprint by just hitting the two buttons as quickly as you could. And whoever could hit the buttons faster would win. Olympic powerlifting is kind of similar to games. You do an action and try to get the highest score. Yeah, I mean, there's a set series of movements that you have to do. And you have to do them better than other people. Well, there's like no player there's no, there's no interaction between the players. You know what I mean? So like you can have a hundred people show up and just put them all into different rooms. And they all do, you know, whatever their max is. And you're like, all right, you win. You know what I mean? Like there's no, to me, I don't know. Like to be a sport, like I, I feel like for me at least, a sport should have some sort of interaction with somebody else. You know, like fencing, you know. I'm trying to stab you. You're trying to stab me. There's rules for, you know, what happens if we stab each other at the same time. You know, whoever initiated the motion first is the point. Um, I don't know. Like, solo events, like, it's just, I don't know. It's like, like, honestly, like, everybody could just stay at home. Like, you don't need to travel for it. You know, just videotape yourself in your home gym, like, lifting 800. Maybe have a judge go out there to watch you to make sure you're not cheating or something. But like, I don't, I don't understand the point of people coming together. You know, I mean, there's camaraderie or whatever, you know, but like as far as the actual sports concerned, like I don't, I don't, I don't really see the point of it. Um, it's like wrestling, you know, it's PVP interaction, volleyball, six V six, you know, best of 25 wins. But uh, yeah, I don't know. So, it, it, like I said, you you are free to disagree with me in this class. Like these are just philosophical things.
single player sports are quite a bit different from multiplayer sports. Yeah, it's it's just kind of a weird, it's kind of a weird uh, notion, you know. Okay, uh, so the way that uh, Sid Meier, he's the guy that made Civilization, the computer game. Um, not the board game. Well, there is a board game based on his computer game, but his computer game was maybe based on a board game called Civils. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so Sid Meier's philosophy was a game is a series of interesting choices. It's like when you play Civilization, basically you should be sitting there like kind of like chewing on your fingernails, like, ah, do I build a musket man or do I try and get the wonder built? But are they building the wonder? I don't know. Like, if I build the wonder, it'll be really great. But if I get stuck, you know, and lose, then I don't have a military and I don't have a wonder. And I'm going to lose. Maybe I can have all my cities go all in on building this thing. And, you know, and you, you just sit there and just go, oh, man, I don't know. You know, you, you just ponder and ponder and ponder. And uh, Are there wonders in Civ? Yeah. Age of Empires. Uh, <laughs> If you build a wonder, you win, right? Like uh, it's a, it starts a time a timer, and then it counts down, and then if nobody destroys your wonder within whatever it is five or ten or fifteen minutes, something like that, uh, then you win in age and in civilization. Um, when you build a wonder, it gives a permanent bonus to your city or to your civilization. So, uh, for example, if you build Magellan's no that's circumnavigation. If you serve, if you, that's different. Uh, if you build the lighthouse, then you get plus one to movement for your ships. Uh, if you serve and navigate the world, you also get plus one uh, movement to your ships. If you build the pyramid, then you get, what's it, grain or something like that. Pre builder. All builders receive an extra build charge. Plus two culture. So um, each of each of them does something, right? And uh, let's see, lighthouse, let's see. great lighthouse, plus one movement for all naval units and gold in the local city. So uh, basically, the wonders will give you a pretty a pretty significant bonus, but only one civilization can build it. If somebody else builds it first, and you were like eighty percent of the way through it, sucks to be you. Sucks to suck. Do better next time. You know? And uh, I guess you could, like, reload from, like, 40 turns ago. But, you know, it's, like, hours of your life you just you just lost there. So um, Yeah, so Sid Meier's thinks of games as that sort of thing, right? Where you have to sit there and, like, ah, I don't know. You know? And so under, under such a philosophy, none of these things are really games. Um, which, which again, you're, you're free to disagree with me. Um, I've basically adopted Sid Meier's philosophy, even in first person shooters and things like that. Like, you might be like, well, what sort of decisions do you make in a first person shooter? Uh, anyone here play FPSs, uh, that, uh, who is it that played Halo? Um, let's see here. Jacob. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, so what sort of interesting choices do you make in an FPS? What do you think? In a first-person RPG like Starfield, there's obviously decisions about like leveling up and things like that. But I'm just talking about like a pure first-person shooter. Call of Duty, Halo, Team Fortress, something like that. Tarkov is an FPS, which is truly just a series of interesting choices. Yeah, good example. Uh, which weapons? Which weapons to pick and who to shoot first? Yeah, um, I'd I'd even go a level beyond that, Connor, and say like if you're playing like a team, um, FPS like uh, Counter Strike or something like that, like at a higher level, like where does your team go? Like you know what I mean? Like the more strategic level, like are we gonna push over here? You know what? What is our sort of higher level plan? Other than, obviously, when you see somebody, you shoot them, right? But, like, there's usually a plan above that. Like, you guys go this way, I'll go this way. You flashbang the room, we run in, that kind of stuff. Uh, like, just trying to go on the attack or stay back to wait to attack. Mm -hmm. 
uh, what weapon you use, where you push, when you push, whether you flank or not. Do you wait for the enemy to push you? Do you go above or below to surprise the enemy? How do you use your utility grenade? Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and so uh, I'm most famous for in the gaming world for creating a modification of Team Fortress called Custom Team Fortress. Um, it had a million different people play it back in the day. And uh, the mod basically allowed people to make their own class in Team Fortress. So uh, you'd be given a budget of $10,000 and uh, you could buy the rocket launcher with the legs of a scout. And that would be almost all of your budget, right? You'd have a little bit of money left over for a little bit of armor. Something like that. So you could go zooming across the map with a rocket launcher shooting people and hoping that you can use your speed and maneuverability to dodge out of the way and not die. Um, or you can play a sniper that could build sentry guns, which was one of my favorite combinations. So I just like uh, put on, you know, the, the well, the face mask thing is uh, Team Fortress 2. Uh, but, you know, I disguise myself as a member of the enemy team. I go into their base and sit there constructing a sentry gun. And then everyone's like, oh, look, he's building a sentry gun. That's so nice. And then they walk in front of it, and the sentry gun turns and blows them away. And they're like, wait, what? You know, and then I run off like, hee, 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 hee. <laughs> uh, you can't upgrade it very much because it pretty much dies immediately. But it's hilarious at creating a chaos when you drop level one sentry guns inside of their base. And they're like, wait, what? <laughs> where did that come from? I'm getting shot by a sentry gun inside of my own base. And it just, like, confuses the defense and throws them into disarray. And then I'd run in and grab the flag and run out while my sentry gun is, like, boop, 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 you know, shooting at people and things like that. And so uh, this philosophy, though, like, underlo underlined, underlied, 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 underlined, underlied, underlay. Sure. Uh, it lay under the, <laughs> the philosophy for Custom Team Fortress because I wanted... I wanted people to sit there and agonize over the build of their uh, of their choice. Like when, like when they're in a game, like like when they start off, people oftentimes just go with like whatever their favorite build is. I'm going to play a scout soldier that can just run around with a rocket launcher and shoot people, and then they end up dying over and over again because the defense has sentry guns up, and the sentry guns don't care how fast you are; they just shoot you and you die. And then they go, okay, re re custom. Respec. Re How do I deal with this? You know, and they're like, okay, well, I like being fast, so I'll buy maybe not the highest speed legs, but I'll buy pretty high speed legs. But I need, I need something to deal with the. Uh, I need, I need something to deal deal with those sentry guns. And so there's different tools at your disposal to do that. Um, the pyro has a rocket launcher in the original Team Fortress, not in Team Fortress Two, has an original. Uh, rocket launcher um, that sets things on fire through walls. And so you can shoot a wall and then everything on the backside gets lit up. And they take a small amount of damage. It's like 20 damage. It's not a lot of damage, but it's annoying, right? And so if you know that all the defense are like in a room above you, you shoot the, the ceiling and then all of the defenders in the in the room above you, uh, are they're ba you're basically cooking the floor, right? And and all of them, like, start going, oh, my gosh, I'm taking damage. And they burst into flames, you know, and they're, like, running around, you know. And they, they don't see any bad guys, you know. And so you can use that tool to very slowly kill sentry guns through a wall. It's like if they put their sentry guns up against a wall and you can get access to the backside of the wall, you can break it by shooting the wall enough times, like, a lot of times. It's not a lot of damage. Uh, and you can destroy the sentry gun that way. That's one option. Another option is you can get grenades and huck a grenade around a corner, a couple of grenades will take out a sentry gun. Uh, you play a spy, and uh, if you want to be really fancy, you can be a spy hacker and go up and reprogram the sentry gun, and then the enemy sentry gun will shoot them instead of you. That's really fun. And so, like, I, I, I love doing that. I'd go up and just pretend to be an engineer and reprogram it, and then I'd grab the flag and run out, and they're like, oh, the sentry gun will stop them, and they're all chasing me. And then the sentry gun flips around and blows them away instead of killing me. And then I run out and capture the flag. And so there's always these options out there, right? And, uh, and, and, and so whenever there's a situation like that, like, okay, there's three people playing engineer on their side. Their whole base is locked down. 
I can't just rely on my speed to get in, get out with flag. I need to think about this. And then you sit there and chew on your finger and I was like, ah, how should I do this? And in the meantime, the game's going on. Like this is in real time. It's not like in a Sid Meier's game where the game's paused. Like the longer you're sitting there staring at the customization screen, going like, ah. like they're playing the game without you. Your team is down one player, you know, while you're chewing over this, you have to learn how to make quick decisions under pressure and then adapt and like, okay, that didn't work. I have to respec again. And all right, guys, you're, you're, you're gonna have to go without me for the next 30 seconds. Cause I'm trying to like figure out like ah, a, a better approach. Uh, CH has similar vertical play. Most floors are destructible. So you can break the floor from below and shoot people, break their gadgets, throw grenades through the floor. Yeah. Very few games do. And, and that's, that's one of the reasons why, you know, my, my feelings on team fortress two are mixed for, I, I like it a lot. Like I've, I've played a fair, fair bit of TF2, um, but they really took out a lot of the tactical elements. Um, like they have sticky bombs in the old, it was pipe bombs. Sticky bombs are arguably more tactical because you can stick them to a surface and things like that. But in the original team fortress, you could shoot a pipe bomb and then detonate it in midair. And that actually made a lot of things possible. Like you could debt pipe jump. Like you could shoot a, a pipe bomb, jump over it in the air, hit it, it would boost you through the air, and you could like land on a balcony and things like that. And uh there's like, no, you know, it's you know, it's too powerful or something. I don't know. Um and so they really sort of pigeonhole the classes a lot more um in TF2. Which I, I don't really like. I like it when a game has a wider design space instead of a more constrained design space. But that's just a, a thing. And yeah, like the Pyros had the ability to mess with verticality. Like you could shoot people above you or below you through walls. And that changes the tactics of a game quite a bit. Uh, so people don't cluster up in a room, you know, which is normally a pretty good you know, strategy. Like one attacker comes in, four people shoot him. But now, you know, in TF1, people all had grenades. And they got rid of most of that, if I recall, uh, in TF2. Um, yeah, it's just based on mechanical skill. I like games that have tactics. Right? That's what I really like. Because uh, my my mechanical skill was decent. Like, the, the players in my game would make fun of me. They're like, oh, you suck at the game. And I'm like, I don't suck. You know, I'm just, I don't have this. I, you know, I can't snipe as well as you. I can't rocket launcher as well as you. But I can certainly, you know, play a spy and sabotage your whole defense and run the flag out, you know, and capture and get, you know, the victory for my team. Like, you know, is the goal of the game, you know, is this a free for all or is it a team? Like the, the whole point of it is to, to win, you know, not to kill people. You know, there, there's a, a pretty big divide between those two things. You know what I mean? And being able to think strategically and, and tactically, you know, the high level and the low level. And, um, you know, you, you have to have a certain amount of mechanical skills to win, but, uh, basically in the game, if you could like just outthink the other team, you could win because you could look at the defense they have set up and, you know, it's a tough nut to crack, but if I do this and this and this, if I get my teammates to help me on this, then I can win. Yeah. And I like that. So, uh, yeah. All right. So, uh, one thing that I, I like to mention every semester is that, um, all these things you're learning in game dev help in real life as well. Um, so-called real life. I mean, gaming is real life. Right? It's an industry bigger than Hollywood, depending on how you measure it. Um, but these, like, let's say you, you don't even go into gaming at all, right? You just, you know, go to work for an insurance company or something like that. A lot of these tactics that we, we, we learn in game dev are used in Fortune 500 companies these days. Um, it's called gamification. And so, uh, for example, if I if I go into Starbucks and pull up my... Have you guys seen this, the Starbucks app? Like, you can go in there and you can pay using, using Starbucks. If I go in there, uh, right here, you can see, pick one to join the fun. Order a flat white three times. Order a hot breakfast two times. Order a lunch item three times. And so, um, join the fun. Isn't that a weird concept for handing them money? Right? 
like, how is that fun to buy coffee? You know, like, um, and I'm going to select one to hit start. And then it says ready go. And it's going to, it has a counter there. It's like an achievement bar. And every time I order a flat white from Starbucks, like, Oh wait, no, that's cup of joy. Um, then it shows me getting closer to the achievement. And if I complete this uh, achievement, I get 50 stars, which is like half of a brownie. So it's like $2 and 50 cents. So if I buy $18 worth of coffee, it'll give me essentially $2 worth of Starbucks credit. Maybe worth it. Maybe not. I don't know. So, uh, but it makes it fun. And there's like stars exploding. You won, you know, and, um, and so companies are using, it's called gamification where you could just have like, here's your point balance, you know, but instead it's like, join the fun, you know, and, and it makes it like exciting for people and things like that. And uh, they use it for like uh, productivity at work. Um, a lot of people hate their jobs. I don't, I like, I like students. I like uh, teaching. I like people in general. I like talking to people and uh, you know, where else, you know, can you go that people will pay you just to talk about the philosophy of game design? You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's fun. Like, I, I love, I love my job. Um, I took a, took a pretty significant pay hit to, to do this because I, I like it that much, you know. Uh, but a lot of people are not. Only 13% of people, and this has actually gone up a little bit since the pandemic. Um, oddly enough, like, a lot of people just quit their jobs. They're like, I hate this job. Bye. You know, and so the engagement level is actually, I think, around 30% these days. Something like that, last time I checked. And uh, and so companies are using like gamification to try and get get their employees to like have fun at work, you know. And, uh, it seems a little bit um I don't I don't think opportunistic is the right word. It seems sort of um sarcastic. Um be a good word for it. Hmm. Dishonest? I don't know. You know, so you're like trying to trick people into like thinking your your company is a fun place to be because we have this fun app that tracks your hours. You know, so um, the upshot though is that like a lot of the tricks and things like that you learn when making games will apply to so called real life. You know, serious stuff like making apps for companies and things like that. Um. So, we don't have it with me. Um, look at my bookshelf right now. So, Raf Koster has a book called The Theory of Fun. And I have it around here somewhere. It, it's a good book. It's, it's half cartoons and it's half like little essays. And so, his, um, his essays are on what it means to be fun and the cartoons too. Like, what makes a game fun, right? Like a game like Pitfall. Do you guys know Pitfall? Mm, uh, <laughs> Ultima Online. That is one of the greatest, most horrible games of all time. Um, let's do Pitfall. Have you guys ever seen this? For like uh, the... No, not for The video game. Okay, so you can see the graphics were absolutely amazing. Uh, you could literally count the pixels <laughs> on the vine. And so you have to like, uh, you know, uh, evade scorpions and falling and there's logs and things like that. It's kind of like an Indiana Jones kind of game like it's an adventure game really basic um i didn't enjoy it very much honestly um uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. there's a total of 32 treasures hidden among 255 different scenes okay pitfall harry can move left or right you can jump you can swing you can climb up and down there you go all right so uh five star review it was a lot easier to get a five-star review back then. So, uh, 
a a five star review. Like really, like even even as like a you know, young kid, like it did not impress me very much. But whatever, you know. So Raf Coster talks about games like that, and he thinks that the underlying oh here it is. Okay. A theory of fun. And so he thinks that what makes um, games fun is if there is a, um, yeah, you can see right here, see people swinging across gaps and things like that. Uh, it's fun exercise for your brain. And uh, his, his main thesis, though, is that anything that has like an evolutionary benefit, like anything that like would help you survive in the uh, primitive stone ages and things like that, we consider fun. If you look at mammals, uh, you know, all mammals have a sense of play, at least when they're young. Um, humans actually play later on in life, and it's actually really good for adults to play. There, there's this uh, notion that you'll see in some people, not usually in gamers, but like in people who are, who've outgrown gaming, that gaming is like for kids and it's very childlike and why are you playing games and things like that. Uh, but the research is, like, pretty pretty solid that, like, old people that play games don't get dementia as often. They don't get Alzheimer's as often. Uh, it keeps their mind sharp. And so I, I think that all people should play. I think people should take time to make sure they play. Play board games and video games and things like that. Uh, but Raph believes that, um, you know, when kittens play, they're teaching each other to hunt, right? They're hiding. They jump on each other. Ha! You know, and they're pouncing on them and fighting and and things like that. And so the reason why it's fun for them is because they're practicing skills that will help them as adults. And then, you know, after they become adults, then they've outgrown these childish pursuits and things like that. But for humans, uh, it's probably good for us to just play our whole lives. And so, uh, you know, first person shooters obviously would be like hunting, right? Like, uh, you know, people would go out into the woods and hunt deer or whatever. Um, archery is a game, right? <laughs> it's, it's also a survival skill, right? If you're, there's a apocalypse, you know, people that have bows and arrows will be able to hunt deer, right? Um, hide and seek, right? It's fun. Right? You hide and jump out of people or, or not because you're hiding, but, um, you know, sneaking, things like that. A jax, you drop a ball, pick up the thing, catch the ball, you know, it teaches hand dexterity that you need to survive. Chess and checkers are strategy. If you look at some of the, um, Rune stones for the graves of like Vikings, you know, like Vikings, like, uh, you know, like Assassin's Creed Valhalla, you know, Vikings, you know, if you look at their, if you look at their, uh, uh graves, essentially, uh, you will see them boasting about their skill at chess, right? They played a game called Hennefadafal, which is, uh, sometimes called Viking chess. Hennefadafal. Am I spelling it right? Probably not. Maybe I did. No. Did I? Maybe I actually did spell that right. Amazing. Okay. So, uh, Viking chess, right? It's actually a lot of fun. It's actually a really fun game. Um, and so, uh, let's see if you can play it online. But the, um, the Vikings best kept strategic secret. Um, the, the Vikings would actually brag about their skill at Hennefadafal. Like, I once played a game and I forked the sky three times in one game, you know. <laughs> and so the Vikings would play it to, well, as you can see here, to practice strategic and tactical warfare, to train their uh, higher level thinking skills, right? And, uh, yeah, here we go. So the king starts here. It's an asymmetric game, which is pretty interesting. Uh, you've got one side, which is playing the king and his bodyguards, and then the other people are trying to capture the king. If the king gets to the corner of the board, he escapes and wins. If um, uh, let's see, yeah, they're buried with their hand of football games, um, made of expensive and fine materials, um, and then they then they found uh, uh, some like old missing chess pieces back in the day and stuff like that. So, yeah, so, like, Vikings would, like, practice, you know, their, their tactical skills, their strategic skills, using uh, chess and things like that. It's a fun game. Look it, look it up. Try, try playing it if you're into that kind of stuff. Hennefadafal is actually really fun. 
there's a lot of variations of it, and the variations make a huge difference as to the win rate of white versus black. Like it actually, the game the game can be very one sided, uh, depending on the rules you have. Okay, so when you're making your your UE five game, when you're making your game, you're gonna want to think about these things. You're gonna want to think about the um, decisions that go, like 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 you're gonna like you don't want your game to just have luck in it without thinking about it. You you wanna you wanna think about like how much luck do I want to have in my game? You want to think about like what is the genre of my game? You want to think about all of these things in advance so that you have some notion of what you're gonna do when you go into it. Okay. And uh, we can just kind of go through some of these multiplayer. I recommend not doing multiplayer at all. Multiplayer is very difficult to get right. Uh, has anyone here played any competitive like FPSs or things like that? Like, I know you're playing Halo, but have you played like ladder, like ranked, uh, ranked Age of Empires, um, ranked Halo Infinity, Call of Duty, competitive Siege? Okay. It's, do, do you agree that it is hard to get the balance correct in a multiplayer, especially a very competitive multiplayer game? Like, that it's just difficult. It's a hard process. And it never sort of ends. You know, because people come up with new tactics. And sometimes they find exploits, like in Counter-Strike. Uh, people found a way of, like, if you stack up, you can, like, stick your head up out of the map. And, like, look around and, like, see where the other team is and things like that. Uh, the more skill-based and competitive, the harder it is for perfect balance. There's almost something OP. Yeah, it's really, really difficult to do. And so my advice for you guys for making your projects is don't do multiplayer. <laughs> I'm just just going to say that like I really recommend not doing multiplayer for this class. It's really hard uh to get it right. Okay. So, difficulty curve. So, there's some games that have an easy difficulty curve, there's some games that have a um hard a very steep difficulty curve, and that means how quickly can you learn the game? Let's put it that way. Okay. And so, uh some games introduce you to the game by just having you play it you know like you're not aware that you're playing a tutorial level you just think that you're playing the game but if you look at how like mario 1 1 is laid out mario 1 1 is world 1 1 is actually a master class in teaching people the mechanics of the game without um like beating them over their head and like saying you're you know press you know was it A or B? A? B? A. Press A to jump. Press B to sprint. Like, none of that exists in Mario. You just figure it out from playing it. And the level is set up in such a way that you'll get to these places where you have to jump. And uh, there are these uh, jumping obstacles. And at first they start off short, and then they get a little bigger, and they get a little bigger. Uh, teaching you that the longer you hold down jump, the... Uh, there, there you go. So when you start off, you're over here on the left, and you run, and if and everybody runs into the Goomba for the first time, and it kills you, right? This guy has got more kills in Mario Brothers than like any other monster. That's just a stupid Goomba that you just step on, you know. And so people run into him a few times, and then game over, okay. And then they learn they have to jump, all right. And and then if they jump and they bounce off the brick, they run into the side of the Goomba and they die. And and so they sort of start figuring out the mechanics that way, and they teach you that if you land on top of them. You kill them. If you hit them from the side, you die. Uh, this, uh, oftentimes, you hit by accident from, like, the jumping interaction here. Mushroom comes out, comes this way, but it doesn't run away from you. It bounces back into you. And then, oh, look, I'm large now. That's cool. And then they have a series of jumping obstacles that are taller and taller. Uh, there's no monsters in this one. There's one monster in this one. There's two in this one. And then you can either go down the pipe here or you run over here, and now it teaches you to jump. Now it teaches you, you can double jump, like one and then two, to get across here, or you can run, and this one is three wide, this one is two wide. And so, all of, like, and then it introduces you to the star mechanics, you can get that and just run through all these guys, and then it teaches you about this obstacle here, and then there's the same obstacle, but now with a pit that you can die in, right? And so it's slowly introducing element after element to you, and at no point do you feel like, oh, this is a tutorial level, it's Pausing the games, like press W A S D to move forward, backwards, left, and right. You're like I know, I've played video games before. Thank you. 
Um, this is just an absolute masterclass in how to start working up that difficulty curve, right? You just start off simple and go a little harder and go a little harder, you go a little harder. And then they get to the end. It's like, da, 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 and you get fireworks and things like that. Um, by contrast, a game that throws uh, everything I use. Has anyone here played Path of Exile? It's like uh, the Diablo series, but actually good. Um, <laughs> I mean that seriously. So, uh, yeah, Diablo is kind of dead to me. Um, after playing Path of Exile, can't play Diablo anymore. It's just so much better. Okay. So, here is the skill tree for Path of Exile. So, let's say we're going to start as a ranger. The only difference in the classes really is, like, kind of where you start on the skill tree. But anybody can path over to any of the other areas if they want to. Templars over here, and so on and so forth. So, start as a ranger. So, zooming in. Okay. Uh, have any guys, none of you guys have played this? Um, so the skill tree has like a thousand nodes on it. Like this is the skill tree for Path of Exile. Um, and then there are places on the skill tree, like over here where you can slot something into it. And then you can build your own skill tree attached to it and things like that. So the way that Path of Exile tries to uh, account for the complexity of the game is the first time you level up, you can either choose a skill point here or here. You have two options. Do you want to do more damage or do you want more life? Both of them are good. You're not going to, you know, regret, you know, maybe that choice later. 14 lives is good, even, even late game. Both of these are actually good nodes, even in the late game. Uh, 30 accuracy is kind of terrible, but 16% increased damage is better than like these. These are like 10, right? So the you know, 4% increased attack speed. So, like, not, neither of these options is bad. And then, let's say I take this one. Now, I've got three options. This one's still available. Or I can take more projectile damage and increased attack speed. And that's also a good node. It's better than this one. This one's only 10% increased attack speed. This one's only... Or 10% uh, damage. This one's only 4% increased attack speed. This one's both. So, it gives you another really nice node. Or you can go over here and get dexterity and kind of escape out uh, to the real tree, so to speak, um, faster, if you know what you're doing. But most new players would be like, oh, this is good. Uh, that's only like dexterity is not really that helpful early in the game. And so you're like, oh, that's really good. That's really good. And then you're like, I like damage, you know, and then you now you have to decide, do I want more damage or do I want more attack speed? I'm going to take damage. That sounds good. Each one of these nodes that I'm taking here is a level. And so by the time I get to my first notable here, which is 20% at, uh, attack speed, or projectile speed, sorry, and 20% projectile damage, and 20 to, this is a really good node, right? This is really nice. By the time I get here, I'm already level 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, you know, something like that. And now I get to choose, okay, well, I've got a few other notables around here. I can take more mana if I'm running out of mana. Maybe it's two nodes down this way. If I'm, if I'm dying a lot, I can get more health this way. Uh, if I just want more damage, there is this way. More damage, more attack speed, more accuracy. And then I can take more attack speed or more damage, more crit chance and damage. Attack speed, movement speed, crit chance. You know, you can just kind of go in any direction, you know. But the, the game limits this massive, massive skill tree by at every point when you're first playing the game having just very few choices to pick from. And, you know, if I level up again, you know, I'll we'll just take a little life here. Like, nothing nothing constrains you to just one path. You know, maybe I'll come down here and take a little life. You know, 4% life, 8% life, 4% life, a little life here. You know, maybe a little mana. You know, maybe I'll come up here and uh, take, uh, you know, this thing here. Get life on hit. You know, that seems good. And, and so basically, as you play the game, you can kind of keep kind of reassessing your character be like, oh, I need more damage, I need more life, I need more mana. And then kind of path down to the things that you want to take. And that's how they that's how they kind of try and manage it. Now, the trouble with this is that if you do that, you're going to get to a certain point in the game and you're going to get stuck. Because your character is going to be so bad, it's going to be unsalvageable. And so almost every new player in Path of Exile has had this experience. They get to a certain level and then they just cannot progress in the game any further because if you just kind of path around and just kind of like take things you, you want, 
uh, your your build ends up being terrible. You can't kill anything. It dies too fast, and it's just rip. You know, you, you can fix it. You can get respec nodes and things like that that allow you to, uh, you know, unselect things. Uh, but it becomes like a question of like, can you get the currency, purchase the respec nodes when you suck and can't generate currency? So uh, almost every player of Path of Exile has dealt with the extreme difficulty curve of the game where you basically have to, if, you, if you're going to start a new league, which just came out like about a, a week ago or so, uh, like you have to look at the entire skill tree and be aware of everything on the skill tree to a certain extent. And then every unique item in the game and every mastery in the game. You, you sort of have to have a level of system mastery at a certain point in order to quote unquote beat the game. And uh, I don't think they've solved the difficulty curve problem yet. Um, so what most people recommend when you start playing the game is follow a guide. You know, go, go online. Somebody will tell you, take this and this and this and you'll be good. <laughs> so. Um, so you want to think about how hard your game is going to be. Uh, some 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 of my students deliberately make hard games, like they'll make platformers. Um, I think you almost have enough knowledge right now to make a platformer where, like, um, you you like you're jumping from place to place. In fact, some of you have have done these already, almost. But like, you step on the first block. It starts a timer running. I can show you how to do like UE stuff, user interface stuff in a bit. Um, not, not now, but like in a few classes. And then you, you have to jump through an obstacle maze. And then when you get to the end, it's like, congratulations, you beat it in seven seconds. But you can make that as hard as you want. And some students in the past have made their platformers very difficult. And that's fine. It's like, that's a design decision they made. Other people make it very easy. That's a design decision they made. Um, luck, like we talked about, you have to think about like how much luck is there going to be in your game. A lot of uh, students put too much luck into their games, um, and that doesn't feel good, right? Like flipping a coin to win combat doesn't feel good. There's no strategy; it's not fun. Um, and then not having enough luck, like I said, sometimes creates a very samey experience. You make a platform where there's no luck in it. Is somebody going to play your game a second time? Maybe, like they maybe they might want to try and beat their best time, but after they've played it a few times, they're like, "Ah, it's pretty good." Like they just will uninstall it, right? Because it's the same every time. Right? How much information you have? Uh, perfect information games are like chess, where you can see the entire state of the game. Checkers, chess, you can see everything that's in the game. That's a perfect information game. And then uh, some games have hidden information, right? Or like in poker, I can see my cards, but you cannot see my cards. And so that is a hidden information game, right? Where you're trying to deduce from the way the other person's betting what kind of cards they have. It's a partial information game uh, in like Texas Hold'em. In Texas Hold'em, you know the cards that are in the center of the table. You know your cards, but you don't know their cards. So you have some knowledge of the game state because the river and the flop and you know whatever in the middle of the table, but you don't have access to all of it. So it's partial information. Whereas like five card draw or whatever, it's a hidden information game. You have access to your cards, they have access to their cards, and you just have to guess based on their behavior what kind of cards they have. So that's one of the reasons why I think Texas Hold'em is more popular these days than old school poker. Because in old school poker, you just don't have enough information to go on. Right, the only the only knowledge you have is they discarded two and they drew two. That doesn't tell you very much at all. And in Texas Hold'em, based on the way they're betting, based on the cards that come out, um, you can make more educated guesses about what they have, or maybe they're bluffing. But you know, you can, uh, okay, two sevens came out and they went all in. I'm guessing they have a pair of sevens, you know, something like that. Uh, and then some games have like Fog of War, like real time strategy games usually have like Fogs of War. It reveals the game progressively. That's a partial information game as well. Uh, balance, uh, how balanced the game is, is very tricky to get right. Like uh, Jacob was saying, um, uh, it's really hard to get balance in a multiplayer game right because players will push the boundaries of what's possible and come up with new strategies and things like that. It's very difficult to get right. 
Um, coin tosses are perfectly balanced, but they're boring, right? Perfect balance is very boring. Um, the, the original Warcraft, Warcraft 1, the humans and the orcs were exactly the same. There was a very minor difference. The wizards on each side uh, had one spell that was different. Like, all the other spells were the same, but, like, one spell was different between the orcs and the, and the humans. And that's it. Like, they were completely the same. They just were skinned differently. They just looked different. And, and that's boring. It's, you know, it's like, oh, I'm an orcs player. No, who cares? Like, nobody cares. You know, it's just cosmetics, right? And so uh, balance is really tricky to get right. My principle for balance is no choice should be so powerful. You have to always take it. And no choice should be so bad. Nobody would ever take it. As long as your game follows that, I am fine having good options. I'm, fan I'm fine having situational options that are sometimes good but maybe not like swim gear maybe not all maps have swimming so you just don't take it it's fine you know um do you guys understand that like basically if somebody says you must play this then your game's not balanced right you must have a bastion on your team you must have a reinhardt on your team or you're gonna lose like that's bad balance okay so um or if the, or if, if people will mock you why are you playing Symmetra? She's terrible. You know, then that's a sign your game's not balanced, right? So, because it's too, like, if there's an option that's so bad, people are like, why are you playing that? Or if an option's so good, you have to have one on your team. Uh, Halo 3 has near-perfect balance. Every weapon and gadget has its specific purpose and is useful. But yeah, the battle rifle's still good. Like, you know, I'll spawn out with the battle rifle and get kills with it, right? It's, it's solid like that. It's not like... Uh, it's not like the sniper rifle, which can kill people in one shot, right? A single headshot with a sniper rifle can kill people. But it's not like it's a replacement for the battle rifle. You know, you're running around in a melee. It's not <laughs> It's not the best weapon for the job there, right? So situationally, uh, everything in, in Halo is, is good. Um, so interesting decisions. Like I said before, uh, I feel like players should really sort of like have to think uh, to play a game like, what do I want to do? Do I want to do this? Do I want to do that? I think that's what makes a game really interesting. Um, I think that, uh, you know, and you can come up with different scenarios and things like that, but we're kind of running out of time, so I'll skip past this. Uh, situational benefits are, you know, like, it, they're fine to have as long as, again, nobody's going to be like, you should never play with the sniper rifle, right? Because, um, you know, none of the maps have an open space. And that and that would be a design like that'd be a that'd be a an example of like how you can design a game and you can design weapons, but then if the map team isn't on board and they don't put in big open areas where you can really make use of the sniper rifle, then they've made your sniper rifle terrible. If everything's like really cramped quarters, you know, shotguns are gonna be great, but the sniper rifles can be completely pointless in the game, so why bother having it, right? And so you so when you do game design, all these elements have to come together. Everything comes together. How, you know, difficulty curve. How hard is it to shoot the sniper rifle? Are you going to have auto-aim on it, right? A lot of controller-based games have auto-aim. Are you going to let people auto-aim with a sniper rifle? Now you're going to allow people to one-shot kill somebody without even having the skill necessary to put the little cursor over their head and click, right? So, um, all these things tie together to make a good game. Um... Do you get positive reinforcement or do you get negative reinforcement? That's a that's a big thing too. So, um, uh, in Diablo, you know, in, in these action RPGs, you kill bosses and they explode in a fountain of loot, and you pick through them. And you're like, oh, this is a new item. It's better than my old one. You're like, yeah, I got a good item. And occasionally, you get a rare item or a unique item that's really good. You're like, yeah, you know. And so that's positive reinforcement. Some games punish you for dying, right? Uh, Path of Exile, when you die, you lose 10% of your level. And at higher levels, that could be like an hour of your life. And if you're on a map that is just a little bit unfair, if you go back into the map, you might die again and lose another hour of your life. And so a lot of times after I die, I just go like, no, screw this map. And I just leave. I just don't even bother finishing it because I'm trying to level and I died once already. It's not working. Diablo 2 is better than Diablo 3 and 4. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, and so what they've actually found is that if you make, if you put pressure on people, 
and and like there's you know an intensity like you're under time limit and you've got to make decisions while you're under a time limit that actually is fun for people so people like having to like you know the the the, the clock's ticking down and you've got to defuse the bomb and you've got to read the directions to defuse the bomb and you've got 30 seconds and like that is actually fun for people like when you put pressure on them and make them operate under pressure and especially if they can succeed they they feel good um yeah there's lots of different mechanics in games uh, we're basically out of time so maybe we'll pick this up on thursday but there's a lot of different mechanics you can put into your games like bluffing games would be like poker and things like that um there's a lot of mechanics you can put into your game and there's there's entire libraries of game mechanics where you just look them over and be like ah is that you know that that seems like fun drafting sounds like fun and so all these things i want you to um think about for your game now your homework for today i want you to play a game and analyze it so on the epic game store let's see what we got up here for today uh payday three is it out it's out click gotta love epic game store gotta love it it's such a well-made product <laughs> it's pre-purchase actor i played a lot of payday 2 back in the day Sifu, okay. Oh, no, 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 no. Cave Story, all right. So, Cave Story, I would like for you guys to play this game and uh, play it for at least two hours, okay? So, if your parents are asking you why you're playing video games, why aren't you doing your homework, I want you guys to play two hours of Cave Story Plus. And then you're going to go to a, uh, a Google form that I'm going to post on. Um, uh, Grime was the one we did last semester. It's coming out of the sequel, though. And so I'm going to uh, post onto Canvas a link, and you're going you're gonna to analyze the game based on these elements of game design. Like, um, you know, what's the, what's the difficulty curve like? Is it balanced? Et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And then we will talk about it on Thursday. So your homework is to play two hours of this video game, Cave Story Plus. Okay? Two hours of this video game right here. And then uh, we'll talk about it on Thursday. Okay, it's it's a rough, it's a rough. Uh, oh, I just launched it in there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you guys think you can do this? Is it uh, is this uh, is this too rough? Am I too being a professor to make you play video games? Why is this? Assigned? I know, I know. Like, I I think I, I I fully expect half of you guys to drop out. Yeah. yeah. Two hours. I'm like, man, two hours of homework. What does this guy want from? So <laughs> this is why game dev's fun, dude. Like we get a, you know, we get a play video. Game. I'm going to play it too. I just downloaded it. You just saw it right there. I'm going to download it. I'm going to play it. We're going to talk about it on Thursday and we're going to analyze it from like all these different elements of game design. And, and we're going to get you good at like thinking about game design and the components that go into game design and how to make good games and fun games and things like that. Okay. So that is it for today. Thanks for coming out. Uh, play, play some, Play that video again. It's your homework. I'll see you guys on Thursday.